Okay, so hello y'all. How are you having a good one? Today we're going to be talking about the Indo-European language's origins or the Proto-Indo-European language, but because it's a dead language and it's so far behind in our history, it's going to be really hard to really grasp specific pieces or chunks of that language. So we're going to be looking into that reconstruction piece in a bit. But to begin with, it's very, very important to know how this be began to be because this tree has a lot of branches and maybe some of these branches might be kind of afar from the ones that we are familiar with, like Spanish or English. But true, this is like, even if they're like, or far, far cousins, we're still related to them. So we're gonna be taking a look into them. I found this cover of a book very interesting that it details four main branches that it had. So we're gonna be looking at it little by little. But uh, first of all, I'd like to start with this one about questioning us why. Why is it so important to really have a clear image of the past, especially when talking about linguistics and talking about or a code's heritage that we're looking in today? Well, in this article that I read that I found very interesting, it was made by a psychologist for a psychology journal, and they make this allegory up between genetics and linguistics, specifically the historical linguistics. So the more we know about this past, the better we're going to grasp and the better we're going to dig what we're looking at today and what we'll be looking at in the future if we're going to speculate on what will be happening a few years to, to now. Also, it's important also to to really, really have a better understanding about our ancestors and how it came to be, how something that it seems so far apart still have immediate repercussions in the codes that we use today. So another important question that they made in this article is that, well, what is it? What are we looking at? Are we looking at linguistics or are we looking at archaeology? Because we don't have a lot of records from Anatolia and these very, very early stages of Indo-European. Well, true, this is that nobody knows. I don't think even the same researchers, researchers, because, well, it's very, 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 very complex. And to really, really take a better grasp at it and to look at it in depth, we have to take a little bit of many areas to better understand this phenomenon that we'll be studying and analyzing. So to start with, we're going to be looking at the theory of Anatolia that is one of the most well-regarded ones and the ones that have been researched, researched lots on it. So to begin with, first we're going to ask us, where is Anatolia? What is Anatolia? Where basically it's just the modern day Turkey, part of the Western coast of Turkey. And you're going to see in there that this closeness to Europe, it's, it's very, very, very near. Also, because of this marvelous country that has been placed of many great empires and civilizations, also has a very, very clear path towards Asia, specifically India. So we're going to see that all these people from Anatolia that <coughs> started wanting to explore and wanting to go to different places, taking alongside its traditions and cultures, well, alongside the language as well. Well, in here, we're gonna take a deeper look into how language evolves and why language evolves. Well, basically it will be, it will vary and it will be modified by its users, by its speakers, depending on the time and space that this language is gonna be developing. That's why we have a lot of dead tongues today because well, they didn't adapt that well to our modern times and they have to be changed. And even though we have some of those inspirations in Romano languages, well, they're not used as the original ones. Also, another important one is that, well, today we have a lot of you know, technology and we have a lot of discoveries and we take a lot of things for granted, but back then they didn't have much. The biggest discovery, well, the biggest adaptation that our ancestors had was the one of farming. Farming was super important because that way we stopped being a lot of nomad, nomadic tribes and all that, and began to having a little bit more villages and therefore cities that became very, very, very stable places for ours and our families to live in. 
So thanks to these family dispersals that began in Anatolia because of their fantastic farming methods, well, there was no other way to communicate to other languages at the time than speaking the language that they used in Anatolia or Haitirit, something like that. We're gonna be looking at it in a moment. Also, one important aspect that we have to see in this thoroughly in the European language is the morphological changes that as I was telling you, because we have a lot of new commodities today. Well, some things like the wheel, we all we'll know what's a wheel, we all know that we have, we have been using it for, for centuries. Well, in here, at the time of, of where we were speaking about in Anatolia, well, most of the new tribes that these new languages were arriving to, they didn't know a lot about these new concepts, about these new technologies that were in that period. So the best way to accommodate this language to the regions that they reached, it was to modify it a little bit, depending on the knowledge that they already have in those languages or those, or those people or those tribes or those villages in some cases. So for example, we have rota in Latin that is to rotate, but rota is proeda. You see that it's very, very close to Roman language today. Or we have queclos that is in the Indo-European. And it's gonna be very, very related to the Greek one kiklos. That is the idea of a circle, not to rotate, but the idea of a circle. As you see, it's something that we have been using for a long time. There are concepts that are very, common that are not that alien to a foreigner or a people from that linguistic code. So that's what they do. Even though all came up from the European one, all we had in here, that is queclos. Well, it depends. Do I relate it more to a verb? Do I relate it more to a noun? Which idea is it more related to what I want to express about this concept, about this new technology or these new words that are going to be evolving throughout the years. So it's very important for us to understand that even though you're not going to have immediate cognates or you're going to have words that are exactly the same in a language or another, well, you have to be thinking about the ideas. I'm always the knowledge that this civilization had or have to name these certain knowledge or new concepts. So uh, there are two main categories that in European languages can be divided. Of course, they both come up from the Proto-European. Uh, one is the Kentum languages, and the other one is the Satem languages. One is from the West, and one is from the East, or Asia. So the first one, the Kentum, well, Kentum, uh, before one, before the C adopted this S sound that we know today in most Roman languages, the C was just uh, another, way, another way to write a K sound, like we have in here, the one on the slashes, that these two K sounds merge together, or in the case of the Germanic branch, it shifted to H, like it happened in English, like it happened in Dutch, and when it happened in German. Uh, for example, you have PIE, that's Proto-European, uh, the word for Kentum or 100 or CN, in Proto-European was cumton, cumton, something like that. And then in Latin, it was cantum. Then in Greek, it's hecaton. Then in Welsh, it's cant. And in English, all the English is kunt. That, well, we have well, remained with that one since today. That's hundred. Red is just a, a suffix for the uh, county, for a quantity, for, for a county. So uh, that's for a part of the Western part that we're here. But the other one that we might be not much familiar with it is the Eastern part. You hear the Satem languages. Uh, uh, Satem in, it's, means 100 in Avestan. Avestan is an ancient language from the East. I think it was from Iran, someplace like that. So in these Satem languages, these K sounds became sibilant. Um, they did not remain either as an H or as an S we have in uh, today, for example, in Spanish. But it came in here as an ace H most of the time. So for example, we have the same word in Proto European, Kumtun, and then it transforms to Sanskrit. Sanskrit is uh, all this language that they can they have been able to explore and find evidence for in India. So in Sanskrit is Satam, same word. 
100. And here it's very interesting to see that this kumton, the first one, the prefix of the word, well, it changed completely to SA and it gave it a little bit more of that Eastern, that, that Oriental, that Asian sound that most of those languages have. Also, there are certain, certain parts of the Slavic languages that are some of the oldest Indo-European languages that we can explore with, like Lithuanian, that is Simtas, or in many Slavic languages like Russian, Ukrainian, and those kinds, that is Sto. So it's very important for us to have this difference because, well, even though it seems like a totally different languages, like Russian and Spanish, for example, well, we're not that far from. And we begin, we begin with a question that we tackle at the beginning about, well, if it is a dead language, how are we going to be able to see or to comprehend how was it constructed? Well, basically with this reconstruction process that many linguists and many archaeologists and many historians have made with Proto-Indo-European. So because of that, fact that many of these languages like Latin, Ancient Greek or Hellenica, and of course, Virgin European and also the language that speak spoken in Anatolia, well, all are dead languages and we only have few, few registers of what they were actually used for, how they were actually used for. So in here where we're gonna be using our deductions and based on, on letters, based on the morphological analysis, like we saw, uh, um, beforehand, well, we're going to see that we can have a very, very close detail on what it sounded like. So uh, we're going to begin with this word sister-in-law that is present in most Indo-European languages, if not in all. And we're going to see how it changed over the years and how it would have sounded in Proto-Indo-European. So for this, we're going to be working a lot with cognates. So cognate is a word that we know very well. It comes from Latin co, it's together, and natus, 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 something like that. But it means born. So the meaning of a cognate is that they're born together. In this case, words that are born together. So in here, bear with me. It's kind of long, but it's not that hard to grasp. We're going to be seeing different cognates in different languages, especially all language, like you're seeing here in Sanskrit. And then we're going to be constructing morpheme by morpheme, the word that we're looking for in Proto European. So, uh, first, we're going to look at these different words. In Sanskrit, you have snusa. In Russian, you have snoka. In Old English, you have snoru. In Latin, you have noru, nurus. In Greek, you have nuos. In Albanian, nus, nuse, something like that. And these are all cognates for sister-in-law in here in English. So we're going to be looking what it looked like in the parent language, that is the Proto-Indo-European. So uh, the first letter could be N or SN, as we have seen in the previous words. So we're going to be looking at the N, we're going to stay throughout these years because the S surely would have dropped later in time. So there you go, based on these cognates and the different morphological analysis that these researchers, the researchers did, we have to understand that these words, these words are gonna be an approximation. They're not gonna be exact, but they're gonna give us a much, much better idea of what we're looking at. So the majority of these words have an S after the verse vowel. So the words is gonna be SNES as this. So we have SN, that is the first two letters that are used in almost all cognates that we have in here. Then you have the vowel U, that is gonna be the most ones that you're gonna be into it. And then you have the letter S, that again is used in most of these nuances of the old languages that we already saw. Well, now we have the part that, well, I, we know in English, we don't have a masculine or feminine aspect of the language, but most languages do, especially the Germanic ones like Dutch and German. Most of them even have three articles like in German. So we have to indicate which would be the ending for a word in this Proto-Indo-European that most likely had this distinction between masculine and feminine. So today we know that the ending A is to indicate feminine in most words, like in Spanish that we know that if, I, if a word ends in A, well, the definite article is gonna be la most of the times, if not all the times. But 
we have to also understand the difference between the all old, old languages like Latin and ancient Greek, that this word sister-in-law had a masculine ending, which most likely was an accident that changed over time into the right article or the right ending that it would be a she, a feminine. So this is the most reasonable option, option that we have seen through some languages, not only Latin and ancient Greek. So we're gonna choose, we're gonna stay with that option. We're gonna choose that ending. So we're gonna see the ancient ending for the masculine and this part was os. As you see, it's not very di different for what we use today. And of course, this is the ending os is masculine. The feminine ending would be us. Uh, very, very similar to what we have today. So we come up with a word in the parent language, the protein European, that would be snusos for sister-in-law. Or nusos, because the S is going to drop from sometimes, maybe some decades, maybe a century. And also, a very, very important part we're talking about the Indo-European languages is its extension. It's fantastic. It's truly amusing how it evolved into this little part in the middle that is Turkey, and how it reached all the way over to India, the southern parts of China, that beautiful peninsula that you have in there that starts with Myanmar. Then you have most of Russia. You have all of Europe that are part of this beautiful family tree of languages. So it's a fantastic map. I loved it. Just for you to rest it and to really see the expansion, to really see the importance that the Proto European has even today. Very important part of European are these inflection cases or noun cases or declinaciones that are called in Spanish. That, well, in the Proto European, you have A, you have the Nominative, vocative, accidentative, genitive, dative, ablative, locative, and instructive, instructive, something like that. Well, that remained, that was the, the, main, the, the main part of it. We have a very, very important word from the Proto European people, equos, that's from equinum part or equino in Spanish, it means horse. You see it still, it's very similar. It, it, hasn't, it has changed, but not that much, not that drastically. So this word equus is very important for the Puerto European people because they were the first ones who started to domesticate these animals and started to reach further, further and further lands because, well, they had a very, very effective means to transport themselves. And we have the Sanskrit that we already saw that is a very old language from India from which Hindi evolved and Punjabi and all those different ones. And we have the Avestan that is the old Iranian one in the Eastern part. You have Latin, that is the closest one that we have to. Most of these Latin cases or declinaciones are still studied today by many people who study linguistics or they're called sometimes letras in here in our territory. And also all English that have four cases. But it's very interesting that most of these declinaciones or noun cases did not reach or modern English or Romance languages like Spanish because it's not necessary. We know that or nouns or substantivos already carry a lot of information. We already know that by context, we already know which kind of declination or inflection is gonna be. It's implicit, even more because of the articles, the definite and indefinite articles. Well, that's fantastic because they're really, really a pain. The people who have studied German or speak German, it's so hard <laughs> to be thinking about that. If you're talking about a dog, which kind of inflection you're gonna, say just to talk about your dog it's terrible so we see that in baltic slavic they have again between six and eight cases very similar to the first one in, in the Proto european or sanskrit Avestan. and then we have german Icelandic, and modern greek with four inflections or noun cases not that bad hopefully we don't speak baltic or slavic right so lastly we have a very, very detailed tree in here that I love from the article that I told you at the beginning. That is awesome. It's awesome. It counts how many years? 8,700 years. So we have 8,700 8, years since the first ones, the first people from Anatolia started speaking this language that you have at the very bottom. Hittite, I think it's pronounced Hittite. So Hittite, it was the most spoken language in the Anatolia region. And based on Hittite, most of these languages came to be. 
you're gonna see, like I told you at the middle of the presentation, that most of the Slavic part, then you have Lithuanian, Latvian, Slovenian, Lithuanian, Russian, Czech, and Polish, were the first in European languages to be kind of stable to give a word, but we already know that evolution, it's very, very crazy in languages and it modifies them depending on the necessities and what the users, the speakers want to do without linguistic code. Then we have at the bottom, one of the oldest one as well, we have Greek, we have the ancient Greek or Hellenica that is super, super important for our Western world, but not only for the Western world, but also in Asia, Greek has really, really impacted a lot. Like we saw in the history class of Constantinople that the language that he used, even though it was a segment of the Roman Empire, they did not speak Latin, they speak Greek or Hellenica, the ancient Greek, not the modern one. And also something very interesting that I found is that Armenian, a very a beautiful country, I would love to be there, that there's also part of this branch about the Greek, so it may not be that different. Then we have some of the new ones above the Greek ones that is related to the Middle Eastern part, that is Afghan, Albanian, and those different languages that we have in that region. Very interesting because we, we would think like, well, maybe it's closest to Chinese, maybe it's closest to any other more native or indigenous dialects that they developed throughout the years in that regions, but they still come from Anatolia. They still have a deep impact from Hittite. And then above that, we have the ones on India. That is today one of the most spoken languages in the world because India is humongous. They're beautiful people. We have a lot of ones and hopefully they continue to grow. They're, they're fantastic. So here we have the Romani, we have Sinhalese, Marathi, Gujarati, Punjabi, Landa, Hindi, Bengali, Nepali, and Kash Kashkura, Kashmiri which are part of that India region. Sometimes we came to think of India as only this bilingual country that they have Hindi and English, but each region, each state, it's so rich, the culture and the richness and traditions that they have, it's, it's, it's really, really, really huge. So because of that, all these different languages come from the same, most of them come from the same roots. And most of them, you can, you can maybe be able to understand it a little bit in between them, like we do in the Romance languages between, for example, Spanish and Italian, that we can grasp most of what an Italian guy says. Then we got with us here above the Slavic part, that is the Polish, Russian, Belarusian, and all those, we have the different German ones, and we are going to have the different ones that branched through Latin again from Haitit or the Anatolian language. I mean, we have or German or Dutch or Africans. It's, it's very, I found very interesting that Africans, it's a kind of artificial language that evolved in Africa because of the mixture of the Dutch language, English and Swahili and other, and other languages that were native to Africa. And because of the heavy influence for these European languages, it became part of these Haitit grand, 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 grandchildren. And it's fantastic. Even though Swahili has nothing to do with this European branch or the Haiti great, great grandmother, well, it's still part of it. And it's very similar to English. So after that, we have Flemish, Russian, English, Romain one, we have Swedish, Russian, Icelandic, Far Faroese, and Danish. That is one of the oldest. Also, they, they missed this one, maybe I misread it. Also, Icelandic is part of this one on a very, very particular category for is the Icelandic languages, la language is that it hasn't changed much. And in comparison to, the, for example, Roman languages that have changed dramatically in a very short period of time, the Icelandic languages have not changed much. And if you encounter a text from 500 years ago, 600 years ago from Icelandic, and you compare it to one of today, a written text, it you will not see many changes, if not, if not at all, depending on the text. I found it very, very interesting while making this research. And then we got ourselves in here in the Latin port above the Germanic ones. We have the Romania list that is part from Rome and Latin. We have the Provençal that is apart from French, and also which was divided by Langdoil, Langdoc, 
we have Walloon, we have the Creole French, we have Spanish, we have the Portuguese, we have the Brazilian Portuguese, Catalan, Italian, Sardinian, Napolitan, any part of Italy that they speak a different dialect from Italy, they're gonna say that it's their own language. And if you take a closer look to it, it really has a very, very interesting separation from the Italic languages. It's fantastic, it's phenomenal. Also, a very important part in here in the, in the European section at this point of time is that we're going to begin to see these Creole mixtures that we have in here at the bottom. French Creole C, French Creole D. That there are going to be a mixture from English and French. And they're going to, you're going to find some places in the United States like Louisiana that they only speak this one. There are going to be cities that only speak Creole, French Creole. And there's going to be a mixture between English and French. Like it happened with Haiti at the beginning, Hittite, I'm sorry, with Hittite at the beginning that it started to mix. And thanks to this mixture, more languages evolved. And because English is your lingua franca today, as it was Hittite, uh, how many years ago? Like 7,000 years ago? Well, it's going to be a way for evolving these Indo European languages. It might be some cases and we're like, oh, no, it sounds very knack or something like that. But it's the way, it's the way to go. Also, there are a lot of countries like Jamaica and Haiti and a lot of parts in Oceania and the region that is uh, partnered with Asia that they speak a lot of these mixtures between English and Portuguese, English and Spanish, English and French. And they have their own, their own name, like in Jamaica, that is Patois, the language Patois. So make sure between these two, but it's their own languages. Also, we have the Pau Pau French in the central and southern part of the US that it's very, very common. A lot of people use it. And of course, the main one between this mixture that is Spanglish, that is tremendously popular. And there are even more and more in books that we have the Quixote de la Mancha in Spanglish. They have dictionaries of Spanglish. They have conjugation tables in Spanglish. So it's very, very interesting to take a look at this and how this speculation helps us to look further into the future. Then last but not least, we have at the very top, we have the Celtic branch that we're going to have the Irish, the Welsh, the Breton, and the Scottish. The Breton is the newest one that is part of the northeastern, northwestern, yeah, northwestern part of France that is called La Bretagne. <coughs> they use a lot. They speak it all the time. If you go there, and you want to interact with people in French, it's going to be hard because most of those people, especially old people, are very resistant to that French invasion and that French language acquisition that, well, it's not very well perceived. So it's super interesting. I'll give you in here all the details for you to look further upon if you want to. And it's fantastic. It goes fantastic readings. You have fantastic videos. And hope you like it. I hope you saw something here for you to grasp on. And hopefully we can talk more about that soon. So thank you much and we'll be in touch.